was very happy to be invited to talk today. Um, I thought I'd to Anna, you know, what would you like me to talk about? Um, in fact, I said to her, could I just talk about what interests me? What I love about Montessori Prime, and she said, go for it. So I came up with the idea that really it is like my favourite thing, hence the brown happy people just tied up this string. So I don't worry, I won't start yodeling or anything like that. But um, I've always been inspired by this quote from Maria Montessori. She wrote this in the 50s, and um, it's, it's always really made me think, well, if that is true, what, what is Montessori for the primary years? What do we have to do to achieve this lofty aim? Because it is lofty. But it's actually something that is achievable, and it's happening every day in Montessori classrooms around New Zealand. We may not quite get there with every child, but... We, this is one of the things that we do believe is that the academic and intellectual um, capacity of a 9 to, uh, sorry, 6 to 12 year old is, um, is actually at its peak in the 6 to 12 years, or sorry, of a child in the 6 to 12 years. And that when they move into adolescence, other things kick in that are important. And that mainstream schooling has got the thing around the wrong way because the pressure tends to go on and on and on as they get older and older. But actually in the Montessori environment, we can get the kids to achieve amazing things academically, intellectually, using their reason, their logic, um, and many other things. But the key thing is without that distortion, as she put it, to the, to the person, without any pain to them, it's a natural process for them to achieve at that high level. So that's really what sort of keeps me going and makes me question um, what we have to do in Montessori to sort of get there. And so, really, when we talk Montessori Primary, are we talking about um, a rich learning environment where um, the child is at the centre and we help them construct meaningful deadlines and goals? Because if that's all we're doing, then a mainstream education is also doing that a lot. And really, that is just part of what we would call the factory model. It's like the, the, the nice end of the factory model that came out of the Industrial Revolution all those years ago, where essentially the children are creating widgets, or we're creating widgets out of them. And as they move through the system, we just tack on value, and then out they go at the end. That's called the factory model. So if really these days in education, if that's all we're doing, then really we're just perpetuating that factory model. Or are we taking the uh, real child-centred approach, really examining their talents and their strengths and um, putting the learner at the centre all the time. Really looking at a broad curriculum, developing all of the wide um, talents that the children can have. Well, if that's all we're doing, then again, we are just working alongside mainstream schools because with the likes of Ken Robinson, who just named at the bottom there, check him out, there's a learning revolution going on around the world. When those types of things are happening in mainstream schools anyway. anyway. But if we are doing all of those things and we are teaching the children the story of the actual earth that they live on, the universe that they exist in, and we are teaching them the story of their place in it, allowing them to find their place, and we are doing that and all the time as teachers looking for that little spark that we know that all humans have and all children have, and then seeing that spark and stoking it and guiding them towards greatness. And we're doing that with these incredibly well-designed learning materials and presenting them in amazing ways. Then combining all that together is something approaching what Montessori education can offer and which will, what, what will get us to, uh, to that lofty height there. So really that's, that vision is what gets me out of bed and gets me to work. There's a slight issue there about paying the mortgage as well. But, um, but it does give Montessori <coughs> teachers a real passion for what they're doing. And, um, and in fact, it's quite hard to strike that work-life balance as a Montessori teacher. And it's not, it's not difficult because it's about meeting deadlines and about creating the little widgets that I can create. That's part of it. But actually, it's about disengaging from something that's just incredibly fascinating. And... Um, but I know I need to. My family needs me to. And um, occasionally when I see the weekends and the school holidays is a bit of an annoying distraction, then I know it's time to disengage. And um, but certainly it's what excites me about going to work every day. So, what do we have to do in Montessori Primary to get there? 
A big part of it is what's called cosmic education. Another way of looking at it is the curriculum of everything. These children um, have worked on a little activity um, together. Uh, in Montessori Primary, the social uh, groups are much more important than these children. Um, the children have um, been working with something we call the clock of eons. It's about the formation of the solar system. And the key thing about um, cosmic education is something that is about the, the narrative um, approach to uh, learning and about the, the world and the universe at large. And when I was small, about six I think, I got really fascinated by the fact that my fingers were wrinkled when I was in the bath. And um, I asked my father what's going on with that. And we went to church as um, children, my dad still does. Um, and he, he told me the story that it was like me, it was like when the earth was covered with water in the great flood and the water drained away, the sun dried off all the water and the earth was left with wrinkles. And I was just fascinated by that concept and looked at my fingers and thought of that. And then I had about 15 and I just went, Dad, what a load of rubbish. <laughs> What are you on about? My father worked for the Ministry of Works. He was a geologist. <laughs> Why are you telling me this stuff? This is ridiculous. That's not true. And it was only quite recently uh, that I actually realised that what he was tapping into was that narrative way, of making things very real for someone um, by telling the story of how the earth was formed. And that spiritual groups all through the years and traditional societies do exactly that. The difference is with Montessori is that there's this scientific pedagogy that goes with the stories. And so these children essentially have had that same sort of joy that I had learning the, the, the story from my father. But they are incorporating current best scientific um, knowledge as they do it. So I don't know if you can read it from there, but I'll just say the first bit. Because this sort of taps into what we're really trying to do. Um, it's about the solar system forming from dust and um, various small particles. As the disk spun, planetesimals were born. And that's the language that they would, we would encourage them to use, is that it's that sense that the universe was born. The earth was born. It came from a seed. So it's these, the, the language that we use is trying to really engage them on things that are meaningful to them. Things that grow, things that decay. The earth is no different to that. So that's one of the hearts of cosmic education. And, um, you know, I guess one of my sort of subtexts in the talk today is about how uh, mainstream education is doing some incredible things. Um, and I'm always looking for what's the point of difference. And I think um, the, uh, a good example of the point of difference is the water cycle. Because all children learn it. Right? But I'm amazed that children learn it about year seven in mainstream schools. Because it's quite an easy concept, isn't it? You know, water flows down, it evaporates, it forms clouds, the sun flows. It's not a difficult thing. In Montessori, you would tend to learn that concept a lot earlier. But you would also do it as part of a much bigger narrative of how the Earth was formed. So recently, um, we introduced uh, the water cycle. Well, we didn't introduce it, we sort of revisited, I suppose, with some sort of nine and ten year olds. And, but what we were doing was um, talking about the early Earth and how the eon that scientists call, the, the word that scientists call is the Hadean eon. And that in the Hadean eon, the Earth was literally forming out of gas and dust and it was hot and it was a terrible place to be. There was no oxygen. Um, the volcanoes spewing everywhere and you couldn't exist. And we, the kids just loved the sort of the vision of the Earth being like that. It moved at a different speed, it was a different size, it was a completely different landscape. And in that eon was where the water came onto the, into the earth. It was formed, and for hundreds of thousands of years, it rained. Hundreds of thousands of years. So the children get very captivated by this, and we tell the story of how the early life formed, and, and the uh, rain was washing the minerals into the water, and poisoning, essentially, the ocean. And, um, putting early life on Earth at risk. In fact, it was the first great extinction, I think, extinction event. So the water cycle, I guess what I'm trying to say is the water cycle would be just one part of this bigger context that the children really engage.
engaging at this level, at the 6 to 12. Um, so, what else do they do, these children? Big work is what we call it. This is one of the really key aims for, um, for children in the primary. And um, this is not really big work, it's just a cool photo. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it, I guess it's, it's a nice link back to Pam's thing of the sort of the pride and the concentration and the revisiting of things, actually. Um, with a, a, a similar material, in fact, this particular material would match up with Pam's one beautifully because it's all based on 10 centimetre, 9 centimetre, 8 centimetre, and so on um, dimensions. Um, but certainly she was very proud of it. But I just want to run through a few examples of some of the big work that's happened in, in the classes that I've been running over the years. Most of these photos are from Berenpore School, where I was working for about 10 years, but I've now moved to Waora School, which is a great um, place to be. Um, so fundraising, catering on a big scale, lunch for the boards. Um, these guys were um, making lunch for about 30 or 40 children, but they were, um, it was a fundraiser, so they were also having to do with marketing, the writing permissions, getting sponsorship, um, advertising, working out whether it was worth spending probably about $80 on this particular meal, would we turn a profit on that, etc., etc. Um, the, the customers were extremely satisfied. Um, they loved their spaghetti and meatballs that day and they ran this business for about six weeks and, and they got themselves to um, Abel Tasman as a result, uh, with a lot of other fundraising as well. But they were very proud of the work that they had done, these kids. And it was a huge amount of effort. And um, there's also some uh, engineering, sort of historical big work that's been going on um, a few years ago. So um, that child survived that, by the way. <laughs> but um, but the, this was about children getting fascinated with bridges, uh, engineering, um, the history of bridges. And... Uh, they, you know, there's a whole lot of research that sits in behind this, a whole lot of um, discovery about not just the mechanics of bridges, but also the, the purpose of them and how around the world through time bridges have created opportunities for people. Um, San Francisco being a classic example of how the whole of the part of the, the area was opened up by that amazing bridge. And um, so we, we tested the bridge with a 20 kilo um, water container before we put Piata on it and that photograph is in front of the whole school and of course it was an aha moment for the children watching um, and it took a long time that bridge you know it, it took a couple of months to really get it perfect it took up a lot of room in the classroom we we're always having to move around this Lincoln bridge um, it was huge it was crazy um, this is about the area of a circle the children learn the formula and so forth, but of course they want to just take it to these extreme lengths. And so these guys are outside, and I mean, if you think about what, what do you need to work out the area of a circle, you need a circle, and you need the radius of the circle. And so there's a girl in the middle, uh, these guys have got the rope, and of course when you're outside and you've got a rope and you've got a massive circle, you want to run. Don't you? So these guys are actually sprinting around and around the circle. What a great way to discover circumference. Um, research is a really big thing. Pre, uh, research projects are a huge thing in Montessori Primary. Um, and this girl's presenting her project on Minnie Deans. Another day she presented this to parents and um, she sort of created this sort of chamber and filled it with artifacts from the day and really got into the mystique around the Minnie Deans myth and, the, and the, the, the kind of the the facts and the myths around the Mini Dean and the children were really impressed. Uh, sorry, the parents were really impressed by that. Um, Pet Day came along uh, as a concept. Um, this girl here, very um, comfortable with animals, her mother's a vet. Uh, occasionally, chickens would turn up in our classroom. So there she is. She's actually doing her spelling while Broody is on the table. But in the back of the photograph is the draft for their poster for Pet Day because, of course, again, with something like that, they have to do a lot of uh, writing of letters, permissions from um, people, logistics about how Pet Day will work, um, and then the, the hard work of the clean-up. And um, so I asked these guys how they felt about having to clean up all the straw, chicken poo, and um, all the stuff that was generally left behind by pet day and um, so they, they posed <laughs> for the photo this way. But they did it. That was the thing. They stuck with it. It was weeks of effort to get pet day organised and then hours of clean up and 
so forth, and thanking people for bringing their pets and so forth. But here's the result. Um, child at Berenpool School, just you can see, can't really how fascinated he is. Um, he never had any experience with animals, actually. And in the Somali community, there's often a, um, a fear of dogs, particularly. Um, so pet day was actually a really big deal for um, some of the children of the Um Fundraising, these guys um, raised about $1,000 um, selling coffee to teachers at the school, out of our uh, classroom. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, I know. Yeah, uh, yeah the morals, yeah, are uh, questionable, but the, I've moved to a new school now, so it's all right. Um, but, you know, they, again, are just a huge, a huge work for them to get this business off the ground and make it successful. And this is the, um, the, the why we call it Native Coffee Garden is that that was the limit on it, was that it had to be um, something that raised money for the native gardens in our school. And so there they are, they created this garden, put the seat in, concreted it in, it's all built from Macron Carpet, the yada, 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 dragged the rocks up from the beach, had some help for sure, but, you know, the point is that they spend their money on this, um, this thing. Um, coming back to that quote from before about this, this concept of, um, of achieving high school kind of level academic stuff but enjoying it, this would be an example of that. Um, Karen, can I have the permission to use Fraser's photograph? Is that right? Thank you, Karen. Um, <laughs> oh, Shane and Stella, is that right? Right, excellent. I've already got me as, uh, got there about 10 minutes ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, this. This, uh, the, the sort of the first four uh, parts of the, um, the layout uh, were shown by me, were demonstrated by me as the teacher. That took about two minutes. It's not a big deal um, because the materials are there to teach the concept really. I'm just sort of opening the door. But of course their natural inclination is just to take it to that nth degree again. And so they were pulling out materials from all over the place to just follow the pattern. I should explain, it's powers of numbers. So it's 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, eventually up to about 2 to the power of 9. 2 to its 9th power. And um, again, you know, it's not typically a primary school work, but it's easy for them to understand. It's a doddle. Absolutely. And I mean, again, you know, coming back to Pam's thing, it's, it's, you can see the, the, the joy and the satisfaction um, in, in their faces about their work. Um, we're very lucky. So the mass materials are very well developed in Montessori. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, um, seen into the, the Montessori materials for maths. Grammar and language is a bit less well known, but again, very rich. Um, I, I made up this quote. I was kind of proud of it. Um, but it is, it's a, really, it's a, the, the grammar stuff is a, is a framework, and it's a, and it's a, it's a tool for um, creating amazing language. And um, so just, just running through how we would use it. So um, this would actually normally be in a long strip, but I can do the photograph. So you probably can't read it. This is just from a book. So this is me taking a sentence from a book to show the children. Obediently and with fumbling fingers, she opened the loop of the golden thread. So then we analyze it. And it's a very simple activity to analyze this and to work out about the adverbial extension, the subject, the object, the predicate, the verb, the action, all that jazz. Um, and there's tons more that can go with that, but this is how you'd analyze that sentence. And so that's the, that's the work of the child. But where it kind of really gets exciting is where um, a child had created the top sentence, and that's a really good sentence actually for a you know, 10 or 11 year old. Um, that's no problem. She, you know, she's made a national standard. But, um, <laughs> but through the materials and that sort of layout where you then take the materials and create your own sentences, um, she created the bottom sentence. And, uh, I don't know. Oh, sorry. So the top one says they wa they watched him trudge up the path to the temple. Then, after using the materials, she had mangy hounds and rancid children watched him pass, unconcerned by his trudge to the temple. <laughs> rancid, rancid children. So I'm like, oh no, that's sorry, that doesn't fit there. No, no, no. So she had decided that rancid would be a good uh, way of describing these children. And, and, I, and I really hope she succeeded in, in creating a, a, a rich piece of writing and a rich image for her story. Um, she's, she would have been, she was a year eight, so 12 year old, 11, 12, yeah. 
um, so yeah, I think my twenty minutes is up. Right? So I was it. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of I suppose the stuff about that initial quote. You know, it's about that big work that joy is joyfully done that leads to this high achievement but at no cost to their sort of spirit, their happy to do it. Um, but there's whole other aspects that, you know, that make Montessori environments wonderful and I think community building is a really big one. And hey, again, we're not the only educational outfit that builds strong communities. Um, but we have some things up our sleeve which are quite handy because we have the kids for three years, three year cycles. So it's a lot. Um, it's a lot easier to build a strong community when they're not shifting out the door every year. So see that factory model. You know, one year move to a new teacher, one year move to a new teacher. Not so. Then not so. Um, and um, but it's also so. This is a forest. Um, this is another fundraiser um, to, to to raise money to do up this forest at Berenpo School that had been out of action for about 17 years. It was deemed to be unsafe. So the kids wanted to make it safe again. So children can play on it. So um, you know, building community is about dragging the dads and mums in as well, but also about doing the work yourself. So the, they they organised this working bee, and they had about forty people there and uh, catered for it. But it was great. Um, this was um, some children. Again, the other thing I should have said about the community is it's self-organised so many times. Uh, not many of these things I started. These are started by the children. This was, we had a, a special needs boy who was about to head off to Italy to live and um, and he was, he was lovely and the kids wanted to do something special for him. So they decided to throw a surprise party. So here he is, <laughs> Giovanni, and you know, just, he just thought this, it was just oh, the best thing ever. And, um, and then just generally sharing kai is a great way to do it. It's big in Montessori. And in fact, this particular meal was a, based after a history, um, sort of a geography project about the Americas. Everything they're eating is, is from the Americas in some way. Chocolate, potatoes, chili, um, camps, big thing to, to get the kids working well together. And then there's the celebrations. Um, so this is our birthday stretch a lift we would do. Um, again, it's all about that building community in a Montessori setting. And the spontaneity um, and the, the self-organisation thing is really interesting. That we borrowed these big gym mats for high jump from high school. And I, got, I dragged it out once with the kids and I was like, we're doing this once a day, max, guys, okay? It would be, you know, I want them going back to the high school soon because that's such a mission. But they weren't satisfied with that. They wanted to go and master their high jump, but we had to get the high jump mat from the classroom all the way down the, the, through, down steps and all sorts of stuff. So they said, Richard, we can do this. And um, this is how they did it. <laughs> and um, they would move this thing in and out of the classroom every day for about a fortnight. It was, it was really cool. So they, um, one day, uh, I don't know actually why, but they just started this conga line <laughs> in class. Just, yeah, but like what you were saying before, Pam. And, and, and sometimes it's quite a challenge in a primary environment because it's very serious, isn't it, you know, schooling. And, um, you know, they've got a lot to get through, don't they? They've got to get that writing sample done and they've got to achieve their basic facts, scores and things, and we can't be having conga lines. But the children teach me differently. So, um, um, this was about measuring the circumference of a circle and only a couple of kids were doing it but they couldn't get the tape because they'd calculated the circumference using pi but now they wanted to know if they were correct. There's no calculator can do that, you can't just wave a calculator in a circle and it will tell you what the circumference is so we had to get the measuring tape but there was only two of them so how do you do that? So spontaneously kids just started going out to help them until Virtually the whole class was out there just to hold it in the right position. That's what they were about. And again, it was spontaneous. This isn't me going, right, jumping around, what we're doing out here. And this is what I'm saying before about it's not just about rich activities, because most schools are doing that. This is about the self direction of rich activities that comes from the children. These are some girls who um, who came back on a teacher only day once they're at high school. They wanted to spend the day with their old class. 
And so I gave them fifty dollars, and it, and I said they have to feed. This is their challenge because it's like, what are you going to do? Handwriting, you know. Um, so that they had fifty dollars, and they had to get themselves down to the supermarket and back and feed our class some kind of healthy meal, healthy-ish. And um, and they did it. They just went just incredibly. So the the, the sort of girls standing around the edge are actually not at our school anymore. They're at a the new school, but um, they wanted to contribute to the community again. So just to finish, um, the observation as a professional is a big part of Montessori and it's actually the best professional development you can ever have and that's another one of the things I absolutely love about Montessori um, because you put in place a goal and then you're allowed to sit back and watch whether it's actually working and in a mainstream school that's not really encouraged. If you have a goal a, a professional goal in a mainstream school, you're just supposed to take notes on it and test the children to see if it's worked. But we really get back to, we get to sit and actually really watch our children and use that as the basis for things like our appraisal and professional development. And Montessori is the best retirement plan ever because I just want to keep doing it until I drop. And then you really do see um, these old Montessori gurus who are still standing up here lecturing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not me yet. But, um, but I think, you know, it's, it's just this sort of uh, this wonderful thing that I feel like I could do ever. So, um, yeah, those are a few of my favourite things <laughs> about Montessori. And um, that's my talk. So thank you very much. <laughs> researching things, but it's about the why and the how of these things that they're interested in, and, and always linking it to something bigger. Yeah. What is this thing telling you about the bigger story, I guess, is what I want to try to push. Yeah. <coughs> 